We'd like to pick up where we left off yesterday. We were looking at the, uh, the different signs of the apostasy as it was arising, and we were looking at how it came from within the ecclesia or from without. There was one or the other how that there was the perfect conditions in the first century when apathy was there, how that it revolved around false teachings that would go out to the world, into the ecclesial world that was at the time, and would basically set themselves into it. And these false teachings or false doctrines would bring about false living. We looked at the character of this system that was arising, how it would be deceitful, it would be in disguise, there would be forgeries that were written, that was the method by which he would use a premeditated deceit to bring about its own objectives. And we looked at the motivation that this system had, how that it was the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, and the pride of life. Well, we'd like to spend a little bit of time, just very quickly, before we get into looking at Revelation chapter 12, just to consider the, the antidote to these things. As we think about the, uh, the problems that there were in the first century, the positive side of this is that there certainly is a way around this. Really, it comes down to three, I guess you could say basic but important things. Number one is personal Bible study. Number two would be the testing of doctrines. And number three would be the protection of the platform. And of course, built into these things, there are other elements as well. But as we consider um, the words of the Apostle Paul as we have in 1 Thessalonians chapter 5 and verse 21, he instructed the disciples to prove all things. And the antidote required effort. It required honesty, as Brother Colin was talking about in this first class, and it also required a desire for the truth. So there's effort that has to be expended on our behalf to prove all things. There's a personal responsibility for each and every one of us, not to come become complacent with what is handed down, but rather to take a responsibility for the truth that, as it has been delivered to us. We read in Acts chapter 17, verse 11, those of Thessalonica, or Berea, were no, more noble than Thessalonica, in that they received the word with all readiness of mind. And that's the first side to this. There is a positive good spirit in listening to what is said from the platform. Not a, 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 a sort of sarcastic skepticism, but rather there is a reception to what is being said. However, at the same time, there is due diligence, I guess you could call it, searching the scriptures daily whether these things are so. We do not believe in a clergy. We do not believe in a priesthood. We do not believe that it should be left to other people to sort these things out. We need to individually have a healthy scrutiny of what is said from the platform and, and what goes on. As we mentioned yesterday, do we do not want to be naive. We have to search out what is being said. There were false prophets, Peter tells us, amongst the, the early um, Israelitish group coming out of Israel. He says, so there shall be false teachers amongst you. And so, of course, we have the words of 1 John chapter 4 and verse 1. Beloved, believe not every spirit, but try the spirits, whether they are of God, because many false prophets are gone out into the world. And again, that's the due diligence. Don't just listen and be gullible to sort of swallow anything that's said, but try the spirits. Try the teachings and the doctrines, is what the spirit means, whether these things are of God or not. And this is a statement of fact that follows because he says there are many false prophets that have gone out into the world. So it begins at a, at a, at a doctrinal level, and if we nip it in the bud there, then it won't flower into greater problems involving perhaps lifestyle issues of immorality, of those who are led astray, or of being made merchandise of. And sometimes we as a community tend to wait until it becomes an issue of either finance or morality, and we forget that it begins with the doctrines. If we were to read the things that are put forward, listen to these things and discern them and begin with what is said and try the Spirit on that level, we'll never get to the point where we have huge moral issues or financial issues. And realistically, if we follow the words of the Apostle John here, we would try those spirits first and never end up in the second state of things. 
we have the words of the Lord Jesus Christ in Revelation chapter 2. I know thy works, thy labor, thy patience, how thou canst not bear them which are evil, and how thou hast tried them which say they are apostles and are not, and hast found them liars. And that ties right back in to 1 John chapter 4. Try the spirits whether they are of God. Here the Lord Jesus Christ says that's exactly what you've done. You've tried those who say they are apostles and you found that it's not true, but rather that they were indeed liars. So it is possible to discern the error. They did it at this point in time in Ephesus. There's a fundamental principle as well. It comes up in Matthew chapter 7 and verse 16 to 18. Ye shall know them, he says, talking about the false teachers and the apostasy, by their fruits. And he asks the question, well, do men gather grapes of thorns or figs of thistles? Even so, every good tree bringeth forth good fruit, but a corrupt tree bringeth forth evil fruit. A good tree cannot bring forth evil fruit, neither can a corrupt tree bring forth good fruit. So this is why we must draw back, brethren and sisters, from those writings that have been proven to be not according to the word of God. And if that's the source, the tree basically where these things have come from, then draw back from the other things as well. Because the seeds of these things will be there. You can't have a good tree bringing forth corrupt fruit. Writers are their words. You can't separate a man from his works. That's what we are. That's who we are. If we stand up to speak, then we must be accountable for what is said. If we put our pen to paper, we must be accountable for what is written. We cannot separate people from their writings. We have to apply this scrutiny amongst ourselves. And so we have the antidote then, just by way of summary, to search the scriptures daily, whether those things are so, Acts 17, verse 11. Try the spirits, whether they are of God, John, 1 John 4, verse 1. Prove all things, 1 Thessalonians 5.21. Uh, we didn't look at this one, but study to show thyself approved to God. Rightly dividing the word of truth, which has the implication there that we could wrongly divide it if we do not do our homework sufficiently. And we're told, of course, in John chapter 4, verse 24, to worship in spirit and in truth. The two things go hand in hand. We do live in an age, though, of toleration. We talked about this a little bit yesterday. We have to remember, though, that during this age of great freedoms, during this age of toleration in the world around us, that the ecclesia is not ours to play with. It is God's ecclesia. It is the Lord Jesus Christ who walks amongst the lampstands. And so we have a duty. The ecclesia isn't like Mars Hill, where there were the Epicureans and the Stoics who stood around to tell or to hear some new thing ventilating this idea or that idea. We have a responsibility to protect the platform from teachings contrary to what is laid out in the scriptures. We read the words of the Apostle Paul in Timothy, 1 Timothy chapter 1, verses 3 and 4. He says, I besought thee that thou mightest charge some that they teach no other doctrine, neither give heed to fables and endless genealogies which minister questions rather than godly edifying which is in faith, so do. So he says, don't give them the platform. Don't listen to them either. Don't allow them to teach and don't give heed to what is said. Because he says, these things minister questions. Of course, we know the first question that was asked in the Bible was asked by the serpent, wasn't it? Hath God said? And so it placed doubt in the mind of Eve. We've got to be careful that we don't follow that course of reasoning where it's a questioning. Not a searching the scriptures daily, that's a different thing. But where we get into questioning the truth and casting doubt into the mind of those around us. Those kinds of things we want to make sure are stopped. It's interesting, the Apostle Paul. I don't imagine he would have got on very well in today's day and age because he was a bit of what we might call an extremist today. He took a position that he gives to us in Galatians chapter 2. He talks about false brethren brought in unawares who came in privily to spy out our liberty which we have in Christ Jesus which we looked at yesterday. Well, how did he deal with the problem? He said, well, to whom we gave place by subjection and that's the same idea of suffering as that woman Jezebel. He says, no, not for one hour. 
Not for one hour, not one Bible class was given for these ideas to be ventilated. And you have to ask the question, well, why would Paul be so extreme? Why would he be so rigid on this? And he tells us that the truth of the gospel might continue with you. And that's the issue that's at hand. This isn't a toy that we can play around with like a cat does with a little plastic mouse. This is the Word of God that's able to make us wise unto salvation. It's not something that we can just play and, and, and sort of mess around with. Deuteronomy 29.29, 29, we looked at yesterday, those things that have been revealed belong to us and to our children. This is our inheritance. This is our life. Nabob knew all, Nabob, Naboth, sorry, knew all about inheritances. He knew all about the value of holding on to his inheritance. And who was he fighting against? Who wanted his inheritance that he refused to give up? Jezebel, who is what we talked about in the last class. And he was willing to give his life for that inheritance. And he will have his lot in the latter day. Brethren and sisters, we do not want to suffer Jezebel today to take our inheritance from us from our ecclesial life, by allowing things like this to take place. And so we had that passage we ended up with yesterday. Be watchful and strengthen the things that remain and are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. So strengthen those things that are ready to die, he says, but they remain. Teach them to our children. Protect them out of love for our God and for our fellow brethren and sisters and our children, that when the Lord Jesus Christ comes, he may indeed fight in the faith, that the truth may continue with us. Well, that's the backdrop to today's class. We'd like to move on to consider now the next sort of part in our, our subject matter, and that is this whole issue of being caught up to heaven. And it comes in Revelation chapter 12. And you might want to put a marker in Revelation 12 for the, the duration of this class, because we will come back there several times. Having said that, we're not going to start there, though. We're going to start in 2 Corinthians chapter 11, in verses 2 and 3. Because it's here that the, the Apostle Paul really sets the scene for Revelation chapter 12. He describes the ecclesia in certain terms. He says, I am jealous over you with godly jealousy, for I have espoused you to one husband, that I may present you a chaste virgin to Christ. But I fear, he says, lest by any means, as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety, so your mind should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. So the ecclesia was to be a chaste virgin, and Paul was worried about corruption the serpent elements within the ecclesia, that they would t uh, take this ecclesia astray. And we looked yesterday how that, that was exactly what was going on. He said in Galatians chapter 1, I marvel that you are so soon removed from him that called you to, into the grace of Christ unto another gospel, which is not another gospel, but a perversion of it. And so that was the situation that was taking place. Now when we look into sort of history, just to kind of get the gauge of where things were, as far as the world was at that point in time, we see that the Christians, under the times of Nero and Trajan, experienced persecution. And they wanted to get away from this, as we can well imagine. And as the apostasy grew, they sought acceptance through basically trying to find societal things they could combine themselves with, so that the Roman civilization of the day would look upon them as respectable and would not look upon them in the same way. So what they started to do was basically become recognized charities of the day by registering as burial clubs. This is a book named The Church and the Roman Empire by a man named Ramsey who wrote in 1893, and he says this, The Christian communities began to accommodate themselves to Roman law, make themselves legal, by enrolling themselves as benefit clubs. Christian communities, registers as Collegia Tenorium, if that's how you say it, it's all Latin to me, um, and they held property. Such associations were commonly for sepulchral purpose, purposes. Cemeteries were the most widely spread form of property. So by buying up cemeteries and becoming legal entities of burial clubs, they were able to build edifices. They were able to build church buildings, 
they will be able to come more respectable with the community around them. No longer meeting in homes, which was probably a little bit too rustic or a little bit too maybe on the edge for some people, but rather they could become more respectable. And the problem was is that as this happened, the center of worship did not become the truth, but it became the building itself. It became the edifice. That was what became the church, as it was called. The other problem is that there was a great move towards church going. It's recognized by one of the uh, early Christians, a man named Oregon. The problem was is that they became what we've sort of termed Christmas Delphians. In other words, they were interested in holidays. Things like Easter was one of the big ones. They would come out perhaps only on a Sunday, but certainly they would make it out for the big festivals. And this is what Oregon has to say. Several come to the church only on solemn festivals, and then not so much for instruction as a diversion. Some go out again as soon as they have heard the lecture, without conferring or asking the pastors any questions. Others stay not till the lecture is ended. Others hear not so much as a single word, but entertain themselves in the corner of the church. Interesting, isn't it, brothers and sisters, that that's the way it would be back then? Because I'm sure that every single one of us could say that we've seen that amongst ourselves, that we can slide into a church-going mentality where it becomes not really interested in the class and what is being said. Rather, the comment is, my, he's going on and on and on. Dinner is going to get ruined. It's in the oven at home. He's cutting into our sports time. We have an activity planned for this afternoon. And it's not about the Word of God anymore. It becomes about all the peripheral things around the outside. That was the problem back in the first century. Bishop Eusebius, who was at the time of Constantine very much involved with him, wrote a history of the church as it had developed until Constantine's point in history. And he described how things had been corrupted over time. And he talks about how that they had sort of lost their focus. And he mentions a, a bishop named Polycarp who was contemporary in his early years with the Apostle John. And this is what Polycarp had to say as Eusebius quotes it. No longer satisfied with the old buildings, they raised from the foundations in all cities churches spacious in plan, bigger and better barns, these things went forward with the times and expanded at a daily rate or a daily increasing rate. But he says, increasing freedom transformed our character to arrogance and sloth. We began envying and abusing each other, cutting our own throats as occasion offered with weapons of sharp edged words and unspeakable hypocrisy, and dissimulation were carried out to the limit of wickedness. That was the situation as it happened. As the persecution, as the church, as it became really, became more accepted by society round about, persecution slacked off for a time. And what happened was that then they started to fight amongst themselves. No longer having a, a really visible enemy out there, they were taking it out on one another. And so they became embroiled in political disputes where there was convenient excuses, they would find arguments, things to quibble over, so they could take sides in political issues. He goes on to tell us, Alas, realizing nothing, we made no, not the slightest effort to render the deity kindly and propitious, and as if we had been a lot of atheists, we imagined that our doings went unnoticed and unregarded, and went from wickedness to wickedness. Those of us who were supposed to be pastors cast off the restraining influence of the fear of God and quarreled heatedly with each other, engaged sorely in swelling disputes, threats, envy, and mutual hostility and hate, frenetically demanding the despotic power they coveted. And so it was all about who was top in the ecclesia. Who would have this bishopric or that bishopric? Who had the greatest influence? That's what it boiled down to in the first, second, and third centuries. That's what the issue became. Think of the words of James, don't we? James chapter 4, verse 1. From whence come wars and fightings among you? Come they not hence even of your lusts that ye war in your members? You lust and you have not. You kill and desire to have. You cannot obtain. Ye fight and war, yet ye have not because ye ask not. 
So as the church became more formalized, more apostate, positions became revered and coveted, and a clergy-laity attitude developed amongst the people. And so it is that the scriptures describe for us in different ways this system that was arising. It's talked of in Revelation chapter 2, verses 20 to 23 that we already looked at, a revelation that basically describes Jezebel and her children, the false prophetess teaching and seducing. Revelation chapter 12, we have this woman clothed with the sun. By Revelation chapter 17, we have a great whore, a mother of harlots, And of course, in 2 Thessalonians 2, we have it described slightly differently as a falling away, a son of perdition, a man of sin being revealed. No longer a chaste virgin to Christ, the picture that opens in Revelation chapter 12 is that of a woman who is now impregnated. There appeared a great wonder in heaven, a woman clothed with the sun, the moon under her feet and upon her head a crown of twelve stars, and she being with child cried, travailing in birth and pain to be delivered. The picture that's painted here is not one of a chaste virgin that the Apostle Paul was looking to preserve, but rather an adulterous woman, somebody who had been fornicating with the doctrines of the Greeks and the Romans. And by the time Revelation 12 had come, Jezebel the woman of chapter 2, had reached the political aspirations that she had had initially. And Revelation 12 is the story of the struggle between the apostasy and the pagan Roman system at the time as the apostasy, apostasy wanted to reach that climax of power. And to understand these signs and symbols, we need only to go back to the word of God itself. We have, of course, the idea of her being clothed with the sun. Well, if you come back to Matthew chapter 13... We see here this idea of the sun is something really that's quite easily easily understood. Matthew chapter 13, we have there a, a little expression that's said in verse 43, the Lord Jesus Christ, talking about the saints. And he says, Then shall the righteous shine forth as the sun in the kingdom of their father. He who hath ears to hear, let him hear. So the righteous in the kingdom will become the sun. They are the political heavens that will rule over the world. So when in Revelation chapter 12 we're dealing with a woman who is clothed with the sun, we're dealing with an apostate Christian system that is now wrapped in regal authority. She also has the moon under her feet, which is a symbol of the pagan religious system. The greater light to rule the day, the lesser to rule the night. It's a reflection of the sun. And of course, it was the Caesars who were the head of the church of their day, or their pagan system of worship. They were the high priests, the Pontifex Maximus of the Roman Empire. They were the ones that were to be worshipped and revered. They were the ones that many Christians lost their lives because they would not sacrifice to statues of them. And so it is that there is the woman. She is ascended up to heaven. Now it's also just an interesting point to note that inside this symbol, there is really two women. There is the woman that we will find later on in the book of Revelation chapter 12 who gets chased out to the wilderness. But there is also the Jezebel woman. There's two of them. Because this is the ecclesia in an apostate form. And then, of course, as it says in John, they will go out from us. There will be a separation that takes place. The man of sin would separate from the the community itself. And so you would actually have that woman in the wilderness, the remnant who basically have the testimony of God, and you would have the woman, basically her child, that would ascend up to God. So in this symbol, at first, you do have both sides of this this picture, and they're melded together. Of course, it's the Laodicean apostasy, as Brother Thomas refers to it, that really is, is driving the bus, I guess you could say, at this point in time. They are the ones that are primarily involved in positioning the Christian church into a position of authority in the empire. Well, opposed to the woman, we have, of course, the dragon. Revelation 12, verse 3, There appeared another wonder in heaven, 
And behold, a great red dragon, having seven heads and ten horns, and seven crowns upon his heads. And his tail drew the third part of the stars of heaven, and did cast them to the earth. And the dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And so, of course, we have a picture that reminisces back to the book of Daniel. The idea basically going back to Daniel's fourth beast. And of course we know the story as Brother Colin mentioned to us earlier on. Daniel chapter 12. Daniel was told that the words of the prophecy were sealed up. Revelation chapter 5 verse 5. The lion of the tribe of Judah prevailed and opened the seals. Loosed the seven seals thereof. And so the story of the book of Revelation is a continuation of the story of Daniel. And so when we get into the book of Revelation in chapter 12, we find there that we have that great red dragon, which is really a comparison to that fourth beast of Daniel chapter 7. We look at the characteristics of the two side by side. The one is strong exceedingly, Daniel chapter 7 and verse 7. In Revelation 12 and verse 3, it's described as a great red dragon. The iron teeth of Revelation, or sorry, of Daniel chapter 8 and verse 19, relating to the fourth phase of the image, those iron legs, the Roman element. Well, of course, John is writing about those things that were shortly to come to pass. And the first of these great events that he sees is to do with this fourth beast. It is the Roman time period in which he is writing. It's the first of the phases that it will go through. In Daniel chapter 7, it's described as being devouring and breaking in pieces. In Revelation 12, it's ready to devour. In Daniel chapter 7, it has ten horns, and it does also in Revelation 12. Daniel chapter 7, verse 19, it stamps the residue. And, of course, we have in chapter 12, verse 17, making war with the remnant. One is referring to the saints, of course. It persecutes the saints in verse 21 of Daniel chapter 7. And it persecutes the woman in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 13, as well as making war with the remnant in verse 17. It is blasphemous in Daniel chapter 7 in verses 8, 11, 20, and 25. It's the accuser of the brethren in Revelation 12 and verse 10. Both of them exist until the Lord Jesus Christ, because if you come to Revelation chapter 16 and verse 13, we find that the frog spirits come out of the mouth of the dragon out of the mouth of the beast, and out of the mouth of the false prophet. So it's there at the latter day as well. Daniel chapter 7, of course, we know that this would, system would be in, in place until the ancient of days would come. And so that's the picture between the two, the comparison, the one picking up on the other. So what Daniel saw is what John is now seeing in greater detail. That pagan Roman system ready to make war with that woman and with her seed. And so we find, of course, in the New Testament, evidence of this. In 1 Peter chapter 5, and verse 8 and 9, we read, Be sober, be vigilant, because your adversary the devil is a roaring lion, walketh about, seeking whom he may devour, whom he says resist steadfast in the faith, knowing that the same afflictions are accomplished in your brethren that are in the world. And so we had this system that was walking around, trying to devour and of course, when we turn to history and we say, okay, what was the role that the pagan Roman system would play with the saints, we find that it was one indeed of the persecutor. This is the letters of Pliny to Trajan. Pliny was one of the rulers at the time. Pliny the Younger is what he's called. And he wrote to the empire, emperor because he wasn't quite sure how to deal with this sect. And so he says in his letter... It is my invariable rule, sir, to refer to you in all matters when I feel doubtful. For who is more capable of removing my scruples or informing my ignorance? Having never been present at any trials concerning those who profess Christianity, I am unacquainted not only with the nature of their crimes or the measure of their punishment, but how far it is proper to enter into an examination concerning them. In other words, whether or not to torture them. Whether, therefore, any differences is usually made with respect to age, or no distinction, distinction is to be observed between the young and the adult, whether repentant entities, or sorry, whether repentance entitles them to pardon, or if a man who has once been a Christian, it avails him nothing to desist from his error. Whether 
the very profession of Christianity, unattended with any criminal act, or only the crimes themselves in it, inherent in the profession are punishable. On all these points, I am in great doubt. So he wasn't sure, because the Christians were not really criminals. So he says, well, are we actually supposed to punish them like criminals, just because they are Christians, or are we supposed to treat them any differently? Do we treat the elderly different from the young? What if they say that they're no longer Christians? Do we listen to that, or do we just sentence them to death anyway? And he goes on to say, basically, in fact, this contagious superstition is not only confined to the cities, but has spread its infection among the neighboring villages and country. Nevertheless, he says, it seems possible to restrain its progress. I just want you to take note of that little phrase, because we're going to come back to it in a moment. The temples, at least, which were once almost deserted, begin now to be frequented, and the sacred rites, after long intermission, are revived again. And so he goes on. But here's the issue at hand. The emperor and one of his rulers are trying to figure out how to deal with this group because they're beginning to make waves in the empire. The temples have been deserted for some period of time. They are going forth, conquering and to conquer, as the first seal told us. By the word of God and by their testimony, they are basically taking this pagan religious system and they are pulling it down. Well, there's a problem in that for the emperor, because the pagan religious system is also credence to him. It basically props him up in his position because he was the god of the empire. So if these people stopped believing in the pagan system, then it would undermine his authority. And so it was the persecution of the Christians really became a reality when Diocletian came to power. He recognized this issue was huge. He saw the Christians as pests who were undermining his authority and basically as the head of state and as the head of the state religion, he himself as the god was having his own position contested. And so he put forward many decrees to put the Christians to death in accordance to the words of Revelation chapter 12 and verse 4. The dragon stood before the woman, which was ready to, ready to be delivered, for to devour her child as soon as it was born. And so it was that there was this great contest that went on between the two. And Diocletian tried to suppress and destroy those churches that had been built and to find those who were professing to be Christians and to force them to worship the emperor. It's interesting, though, that the Lord Jesus Christ had something to say about this very thing. Come back to Matthew chapter 10. Matthew chapter 10, the Lord Jesus Christ talked about persecution and he told the disciples how to handle it. Matthew chapter 10 and at verse 23, says, When they persecute you in the city, flee to another. For verily I say unto you, ye shall not have gone over all cities of Israel till the Son of Man be come. But that was the policy, and he's talking, of course, prior to AD 70. But the issue was, when persecution, persecution came, flee. That's what they were supposed to do. Get out. Don't stand there for martyrdom. Don't line up for the executioner's block. Persecution and martyrdom were not things to be sought after or to be glorified. And we want to keep that very clear in our minds today. Because that's what Christ told them to do. To get out and to leave. Hmm, it would be very interesting as we patch up with this later on for two reasons. Number one, the apostate Christian church did exactly that. 
They dug up the dead and began to worship them as though they were gods. Not only that, but a man like Wycliffe, who was a faithful person who tried to uh, expand the word of God, one of the two witnesses, you could say, whether or not he held the truth is, is another issue, but he was one that they dug up and they burned him. But that's what Eusebius says the pagans did. So, of course, we'll see later on that they became exactly the thing that they protested against. And so, there were also many brethren, as we have mentioned. I saw under the altar the souls of them that were slain for the word of God and for the testimony which they held. That was their issue. They held the word of God and they cried with a loud voice, saying, How long, O Lord, holy and true, dost thou not judge and avenge our blood on them that dwell on the earth? And so the picture in Revelation chapter 6, verse 9 and 10, of those who were sacrificed by this system as it tried to stamp out the woman before her child would be, uh, would be born. And so the persecution of the dragon was there in that initial stage. But of course there was the other section that we read of in Thessalonians. And it describes this dragon as being that which with restrains or withholds. Second Thessalonians chapter 2 and verses 6 to 8, talking about the man of sin. And Paul says there's something in the way of this man of sin that's holding him back. He says, you know how, uh, what restrains that he might be revealed in his time, for the mystery of iniquity does already work, only he who now restrains will restrain until he will be taken out of the way and then shall the wicked be revealed. Remember the words going back to that of Pliny. He says it's possible to restrain the progress of the system at this point in time. And so it was the pagan Roman system that held back the apostasy, that stopped it from developing fully. But of course this would not last for long because that which we strained would be removed. Diocletian, the emperor around the year just prior to the 300s, he was the one who set up four emperors. There was Galerius, Constantius, Maxentius, and Licinius. And he divided the empire into four. Hence the terms in the book of Revelation, the fourth part of heaven that we deal with in the time period of the seals. And he gave decrees to these men to persecute the Christians. And as they were spread out throughout the empire in their different areas, they were to carry out those decrees. But onto the scene would come the man-child. In verse 5 of Revelation 12, she brought forth a man-child who was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, and a child was caught up to God and to his throne. And this man-child, or the man as it really is, is seen in several of the prophecies. He comes up in Revelation chapter 12, verse 5, as we have seen. He's talked about in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 3, as the man of sin, the son of perdition. He also comes up in Revelation, or sorry, in Daniel chapter 7, verse 36, the little horn, the one that had eyes like a man as it would fully develop over time. And so it is that we have the story of Constantine, who lives out this parable of the woman being impregnated by the apostasy to give forward birth to a man. Constantine was the son of Constantius, one of those four emperors. And Constantius was a pagan Roman who lived in the area of Britain. He was over the Gaulish side of the empire, as it was called, which included Britain, France, and into a little bit of the area of Germany. He married a Christian woman named Helena and gave birth to a son who would be both son of a Christian and son of a pagan. So he was an intermingling of two seeds in type. He was the man of sin who was to unseat that Roman dragon in its first form. Constantine's father died while he was on one of the campaigns in Britain. And Constantine was proclaimed by his troops as emperor over this fourth part of the empire. The only problem was that really it was Diocletian who should have said who was to be the next emperor. And so he really was out of sorts with the empire at first, the other three. And so he had to go on a mission, I guess you could say, to assert himself as that emperor. 
And so he made war against the rest of the empire, beginning with the emperor on the, on the western tip of the earth, the western side of the empire, which would have been Maxentius. And so we read in Revelation chapter 12 and verse 7, there was war in heaven. Michael and his angels fought, and the dragon and his angels fought, and the great dragon was to be cast out. Because Constantine was lifted up, he was elevated to that position of power. We're going to talk about that in a few moments. But in so doing, there was now a battle taking place between the pagan Roman system and the Christian Roman system. See, Constantine fought against this system. And it's interesting, as we consider this war in heaven, we have it described in several ways. Michael and his angels. And the word Michael, of course, is that Hebrew name, he who is like El. It comes up in Thessalonians, who like God. And here is this one who fights against the dragon. It's that which was strained in in 2 Thessalonians 2, verse 6, that will be removed. And in Daniel chapter 11, it talks about one who would exalt himself above every god and would not regard the god of his fathers. And so Constantine put aside his pagan Christian roots and sought consolus, I guess you could say, or support in the Christian Roman Empire, in the Christians of the Roman Empire. And there was lots of reasons for doing this. He was in one little area in, in Europe, but the Christians were scattered throughout. They had been persecuted. They had been somewhat um, downtrodden, but they had their own network of bishops. They had a network of individuals that would travel backwards and forwards. So throughout the whole empire, he had this little spy network that he was able to use and harness. And so it was that he decided he needed something that would help him propel himself, motivate his troops, motivate those around him to prove that he was the great emperor. Now before, he'd had a vision of Apollo. And he had seen this great god Apollo that had told him that he was to do great things. But Apollo, of course, was the god of the other emperors. He was pagan Rome, and he would have to vie for the attention of the people. So he decided that instead of Apollo, we needed something new. So, of course, he picked the Christian god. And he had that pretended vision, as we see here, at the Battle of Milvian Bridge where he pretended, just like he had pretended to see Apollo, and if we're ever wondering about the validity of this vision, you have to ask, well, was his first vision valid or not? And he pretended to see up in the heavens the sign of a cross, and the voice from heaven that would say, in this sign, conquer. Well, that wasn't actually the sign of a cross. It was the sign of the labarum, as it's called, the P and the X, or actually it's the other way around, it's XP which kind of makes you wonder about Microsoft. But anyway, it's the word Christos, right? Christos was that symbol that would really be used, and it was put by Constantine onto the helmets of his soldiers. So in their foreheads, they would have the sign of the XP, the liberum, the mark or the initials of Christ as it was to be. Of course, there were coins that were to be struck later on. Well, the great story played out on this bridge in Rome. This is the Milvian Bridge outside of Rome where Constantine, as he came, defeated the armies of Maxentius and they were in full retreat. And as they crowded over this bridge to try and get away from the, from the armies of Constantine, the emperor, fully clad in his armor, was forced by accident over the edge and fell into the waters. And with all that weight of armor, he sank like a stone into the river. And so it was that he was drowned. And Constantine became ruler over half of the entire empire. At the same time, Licinius was taking out Galerius on the other side of the empire. And he became sort of sovereign over that side. So now there's just two emperors. And it would be about seven years of peace between the two of them when Licinius finally rose against Constantine. And Constantine, needless to say, as the scriptures indicated, clobbered him and became sole emperor over the whole Roman world. And so it was that that great dragon was cast out and, pressing the right button here, there we go. The great dragon was cast out, described in Thessalonians that he was restrained to be taken out of the way and the God of the fathers to be put aside in Daniel chapter 11. The man-child, the man of sin, was to rise up to heaven. 
But it's interesting to see how this is described. This is a letter that was written to Eusebius um, by Constantine. And this shows you how close the two of them were. Victor Constantius, Maximus Augustus, to Eusebius. By now the liberty is restored, and that serpent, and notice the language here, driven from the administration of public affairs by the providence of the supreme God and our instrumentality, let's not forget, we trust that all can see the efficacy of the divine power and that they who through fear of persecution or through unbelief have fallen into any errors will now acknowledge the true God and adopt in future the course of life which is according to truth and rectitude. And so we see there that he was to have power over the system and cast it from heaven. It's interesting that in so doing he struck several coins to celebrate this. Here's one of them where we see the liberum up high there, the, the P and the X, victorious over the serpent. And this is Eusebius as he describes what took place. He caused to be painted, that is Constantine, on a lofty tablet and set up in the front of his palace so as to be visible to all, a representation of the salutary sign placed above his head, and below is that of the savage adversary of mankind, by which means of the tyranny of the ungodly has wasted the church of God, falling headlong under the form of the dragon to the abyss of destruction. And so that was the way it was. The cross, as they saw it, or the liberum, was to be trodden underfoot, of, or sorry, the cross was to tread underfoot the dragon. He goes on to describe how that this dragon, the crooked serpent, was to be trodden under feet in this picture that was painted of Constantine and of his children. He goes on, of course, to say, I am filled with wonder, this is Eusebius, at the intellectual greatness of the emperor, who, as if by divine inspiration, thus expressed what the prophets had foretold concerning this monster, saying, God would bring his great and strong and terrible sword against the dragon, the flying serpent, and would destroy the dragon that was in the sea. This was of which, <clears throat> sorry, this it was of which the emperor gave a true and faithful representation in the picture described above. So you see, brothers and sisters, that in that day, they saw these things as being a fulfillment of Bible prophecy. They had it a little bit mixed up, but they were in somewhat right that Constantine was indeed the man-child who would stand underfoot that pagan Roman system, that child that was to be caught up to God and his throne. Second Thessalonians calls it a little bit different. He as God sitting in the throne of God, showing himself that he is God. Daniel 11, verse 36, he shall exalt himself. And so it was that the ecclesia, apostate, I should say, the church, was to rise with him. Eusebius goes on to describe how wonderful it was. He says, the emperor also personally invited the society of God's ministers distinguishing them with the highest possible respect and honor, showing them favor in deed and word as persons consecrated to the service of God, and accordingly they were admitted to his table. He made them his companions in travel, believing that he whose servants they were would thus help him. They were going to protect him somehow. Besides this, he gave them from his own private resources costly benefactions to the churches of God, both enlarging and heightening the sacred edifices and embellishing the august sanctuaries of the church with abundant offerings. And so we see that's exactly what happened. The false church rose up to power like never before had been seen. It also says that he was to rule all nations with a rod of iron, to reign over the kings of the earth, it comes up later on, magnify himself above all in Thessalonians, and to look more stout than his fellows in Daniel, although that is also later on, but we see these things sort of beginning to come up. The totality of Constantine's victory is really unparalleled in Roman history. Never before had an emperor supplanted three others. 
Never before had the entire state religion been successfully changed over. It might have taken a different tack for a while, whether they were to serve Mercury or Apollos or one of the other gods, but it was only for a moment. Never before had a class of somewhat nobodies risen to such elevation as the apostate church did. As our brother Colin described for us in Revelation chapter 6, verse 14, the heaven, the pagan system, rolled up like a scroll, departed. All that system of things was just rolled out of the way and taken away. It was done away with. And so it was that Constantine rose to such power, the Roman Empire was graced, as it were, by its head, in the person of a single and supreme ruler whose sole authority pervaded the whole. That's the way it was. He was supreme over all. So he himself, as sole sovereign of the Roman world, extended his authority over the whole human race. That was the situation as it would be. But it's interesting if we keep reading in Revelation chapter 12. If you come down to the end, or sort of middle end of the chapter, we're not going to get into all the, the things in the end. We can't quite have time to do a full exposition of chapter 12. For that we have Eureka. We can always go and read that. Um, but there is a little section in verse 10 that's kind of interesting. He says, I heard a loud voice, which is actually the word, a great voice, in heaven, saying, Now is come salvation and strength and the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ, for the accuser of our brethren is cast down, which accused them before our God day and night. Now there's a couple of contextual things we just want to notice here. First of all, he says, now, he says, he heard a great voice. And immediately, the area should sort of prick up there a little bit. Because there's a great voice that comes from the little horn, isn't there? It speaks blasphemies. Well, where is this voice? It's in heaven. Well, who, at this point in time, is in heaven? Well, if we look in Revelation chapter 12, we find in verse 5 that this man-child was caught up to God and to his throne. And in verse 7, that's where the war was to take place, where he, like God, Michael, was to fight and his angels against the dragon and his angels. But notice what also is said here. Now is come salvation. The word means safety or deliverance from the pagan Roman system. Strength which means the power of an armed force. Interesting, just over chapter 13, verse 2, that's exactly the same word that's used when it says the dragon gave him his power, his seat, and his authority. And the kingdom of our God and the power of his Christ. This, brethren and sisters, is the voice of the apostasy in heaven, saying we now are the kingdom of God on earth. And that becomes one of their major cornerstone doctrines, as we're going to see, that will bring them against the Lord Jesus Christ in the latter day. Based on this idea here, I guess I should say this idea here, based on this idea here, they will stand up against him because they will be in rivalry for the kingdom of God on earth. The one in Jerusalem, he's going to establish a kingdom upon the earth? Not so. We are the kingdom of God. And this great cry that goes out here is the cry of the apostasy asserting itself. It's interesting that Eusebius should say this. Soldiers with naked swords kept watch round the palace gate, but men of God passed through the midst of them without fear, entered the heart of Constantine's palace. They sat down, some at the emperor's table, the rest at a table on either side of it. It looked like the very image of the kingdom of Christ. It was altogether more like a dream than a reality. See, the apostasy saw at this point in time, their fortunes had changed. No longer were they persecuted by the dragon. They would now become supreme over all. And as we will see in our second class, or our third class, sorry, they would then begin to execute the power and the authority that they had taken to themselves. It's interesting that Constantine 
never really became a Christian, never really believed. Not until the very end of his life, about three days before he was dead, he decided that he should get baptized because he wanted to enjoy the pleasures of the afterlife. And so it was, through all the debates that would take place on the Trinity and all these things that he would participate in, he wasn't a Christian. He was still a pagan. And it wouldn't be until his death that he would actually convert to Christianity. But there's that system enthroned in heaven. And tomorrow, God willing, we'll pick up the story and see what it would do now as it had the ascendancy, as it had the power, as we follow through the rest of Revelation chapter 12 and into chapter 13. Thank you.